welcome everybody. It's time once again for the next chapter with Charlie Hedges. As he explores turning the page on his life and yours. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Paul. You know, today we live in an unprecedented time of total disclosure of the personal lives of our politicians and and famous people, male and female. It's it's very troubling. Um, but today we will discuss with Anne Michaud, uh, a journalist, the stories of the wives of particular famous political men involved in serial sex scandals and deeply held personal agendas and other deal making, and and you know one thing that that I that I found was the question is frequently asked about these women, why do they stay with such philanderers, and and the common responses range from some people feel it's a weakness, and others feel it's a misguided drive towards some sort of per, uh, personal advantage. And I find neither one of those in your book. I think you, I think you, you address those those things so so clearly. And Anne Michaud very uh, aptly clarifies the motivations, strategies, tactics of these women in their truly in her truly emotional, insightful book titled "Why They Stay: Sex Scandals, Deals, and Hidden Agendas." And this. I got to tell you, folks, is a must read. And today's thought provoking and marvelous, insightful chat, Anne offers surprising conclusions about how certain women have dealt with the most difficult of husbands. Now, a bit on Anne, she is a renowned and highly credentialed journalist, a veteran political journalist. Anne Michaud is the editor of Crane's New York. She previously reported for the Wall Street Journal and wrote a nationally syndicated op-ed column for Newsday and has won more than 25 writing and reporting awards and was twice named columnist of the year by statewide New York journalism associations and covered Bill Clinton's 1996 re-election campaign, Anthony Weiner's 2005 mayoral bid and Elliot Spitzer's rise and fall as New York governor. Her work has appeared in Ms the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, Newsweek, Business Week, Crane's New York Business, Cincinnati Magazine, and more. Uh, we are in for a treat. And with that, let's bring on Anne Michaud. Anne, welcome to the next chapter with Charlie. Hi, Charlie. It is great to be here. It's going to be great to have you. I I, I learned so much from your book. It was it was really odd when I called you the first time and said, I'm not really sure that this is right for my show. I know it had to be a weird call. And then after our conversation, I said, oh, my goodness, I've got to, will you please forget what I said to begin with? I've got to have you on the show because this is this is so good. Um, and, and, and you've done such an excellent job. And I have to admit that after reading your book, I have an even greater appreciation for a deep and utterly resolved character of the wives of these, um, I said somewhat wayward men. I don't think it was somewhat of these wayward men. Um, mm. And your stories describe many similarities, both of husband and wives, as far as dissimilarities. Um, now, Anne, before we get in deep into this subject and we're talking about personalities and strategies and objectives, I think it would be helpful. You write about eight famous, well, you know, some very famous and some not quite so famous, but every most everybody has heard of them. And you write about these eight couples, and, I, and you offer an idea of the criteria you use to describe the reasons behind their behaviors, uh, the behaviors mm-hmm. especially of the women to, that protected their husbands. And and in fact, the, the 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 interesting thing of the eight couples, I I discovered that only two ended up in divorce. Is that right? Uh, you're correct. That only two have divorced. The uh, Spitzers, so the Spitzer, who were he was as you said the governor of New York, and um, Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner, who he was the uh, congressman. And she is the chief of staff for Hillary Clinton. 
Yeah, she's a player as well. And, mm-hmm. um, and, and you know, and this may be shocking because I, I think there are people that on the outset, before we really get into this, will view this as almost a negative on the wife. Why did they put up with that? They should have never put up with that. They should have walked on those, on those philanderers and so much more involved that you bring up that I, I think is, is essential. Now, I'm going to ask a very difficult task of you, Anne. You have eight couples, many we know very well. Can you give me a brief discussion or a brief description of the couples, their sort of issues, what makes them a part of your book? Let's start with Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, which we're all shocked that, you know, I had no idea that Franklin Roosevelt had had sexual liaisons. Mm-hmm. If you don't mind, I, I would start with how I got started on this topic. Oh, perfect. And, um, yeah. It was 2014, and uh, I was talking with a literary agent, and she said she thinks that Hillary Clinton's going to run for president, and there hasn't been really any good look at why she stayed in her marriage. People still seem very divided over whether they think that was a good idea or what it says about her character. And why don't I try putting together a book on that? So that's where we started. And I agreed that the conversation about Hillary Clinton, who was now becoming one of our most prominent politicians, was sort of stuck in the 90s. Um, you know, same same answers we had back then. And not that it would matter if she were your next-door neighbor, but um, here she's running for president. I started taking a look at the prominent couples where the man had um, come to a political crisis over a liaison uh, and went back to as far back as Eleanor Roosevelt, as you mentioned, Eleanor and FDR. For them, the the crisis wasn't public during their lives. It came out in the 60s. Eleanor died in the early 60s, and her husband obviously predeceased her. I think the first couple that I gravitated toward because, number one, she uh, was um, an idol of Hillary, and um, I think that her decision within the marriage set a stage for a lot of political couples. The two of them were, um, as I said in the book, living separate lives together uh, after she found out about his first affair. um, They sort of had these parallel lives as a married couple. The next one I looked at was uh, Jackie and Jack Kennedy. Before we get into Uh, that, I I need to tell a story that that really explains the reluctance of the media to cover these sorts of things. I recall a story about Babe Ruth, and this was, gosh, I can't even tell you the years. I can't remember when Babe Ruth played, 20s, 30s, something like that. And the press corps, they traveled with the team on a train, and the press corps was in the cabin in front of the team, and the press corps was sitting around playing cards at the table. All of a sudden, the door smashes open. A naked woman, no, no, a naked Babe Ruth comes running through, <laughs> comes running through the train, and behind him is a woman with a knife <laughs> running oh after God. him. And the reporters <laughs> say, damn, there's another great story we can't report. <laughs> But that was the times that we did not we did not get into peaceful mm-hmm. people's personal lives, and now right. it's very different. So let's move on to your next couple. Sure, and I think I ordered them in the book in chronological order, and I think that one of the stories that that, that ends up telling is how the press dealt with these different scandals differently over time and how that evolved. So that was also fascinating to me as a a press person. 
Jackie and Dave K. I chose them, obviously, because they are iconic. And again, I think set a lot of the stage for the women who would come after um, in terms of Jackie Kennedy. The next couple is Marion Stein and Jeremy Thorpe. They are British and People, some people might um, know Jeremy Thorpe's story from a recent film, a uh, very British scandal with Hugh Grant. Right, I watched in that. that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I thought he did a good job. <laughs> and I think, you know, I, I was interested especially in that in part because it was a homosexual affair. Wanted to try to maybe... Look at different aspects of, of this. There are, are unfortunately a lot of couples I could have chosen, and I was trying to get a little bit more variety. On the homosexuality, it wasn't just homosexuality. It was he was accused of a, uh, not attempted murder, but but planning for murder. What do they call that? He, Conspiracy. He, what's it? Yeah, that he was that he had hired somebody to kill this this. Yep this guy that he had a homosexual affair with. So it it gets a That's little right. bit it gets a little bit more complicated than homosexuality, which is <laughs> pretty complicated. You're right. You're right. Yeah, and he was major British Parliament, leader of the Liberal Party. These people are not small time people. They're they're big people. Yeah. I think, you know, the more you're prominent, I guess the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> The more prominence you have, the more um, the scandal is uh, reverberate. Yeah, yeah. Known as the Jack Kennedy of Britain. I That's think. right. I read that um, he was the Jack Kennedy of Britain. Unfortunately, the hired hitman did not kill Norman Scott, who was his lover. He right. killed Norman's dog. Right, Rinka. Rinka. See, I read the I'm book. <laughs> it's a crazy story, right? It is a crazy because he was afraid the dog was attacking him. He claimed. That's right. That's right. A big great game. Yeah. Okay. Next in our chronology, Hillary and Bill Clinton. For obvious reasons, they are, um, you know, White House intern scandal uh, during Bill Clinton's presidency was just sort of a watershed, I think, for um, what you talked about, the coverage, you know, being, um, going to a man's or a politician's behavior, does that go, can we infer that he's he will cheat on us as taxpayers or voters or, you know, I think um, the press began more using that, um, a, how a person conducts his his private life as a as a proxy for um, can we trust him? You know, um, just as an aside, what what do you take of that? Do you do you see a correlation, or do you see that they can be totally separate? No, I think it bothers me to think that a that someone would treat the women in his life the way that these men have. I mean, that's really my issue. If if a couple agrees that they there was a, an infidelity and, and you know, uh, and they're going to get past it, that's none of my business. But if he's my president and he's repeatedly cheating on his wife, does that mean that, you know, that he doesn't respect women fundamentally? Or is it more that he's got a sort of compulsion that he is can't help himself um, when there's a beautiful woman around? I don't know. So yeah, and, and you know, and my guess is it's is it's a bit of both, wouldn't you think? A bit of uh, uh, both that that they and... they don't respect women to the degree that they oh. should, and they've got a predilection, yeah, yeah, they've got yeah, some sort of yeah. addiction that's or some sort of some sort of dis-ease that they are trying yeah. to resolve. Yeah. yeah. Uh, absolutely. I agree with you there. And you do a great job in the book of talking about 
you know, that's what I just loved about the book is the history of each of the couples, the histories of each of the individuals. And so you got a real feeling of who you're dealing with. It was, there was, mm-hmm. there was, it was, it was truly excellent journalism. You know, you gave, you gave in-depth stories that gave us insights into the characters. It was, that was brilliant. So let's, let's move on to, uh, Wendy and David Vitter. <laughs> They are a Louisiana couple, and um, he was a U.S. senator and um, was discovered his name uh, as a client of a woman who was known as the D.C. Madam. And um, he and his wife, what I thought was kind of an interesting twist, they held one press conference talked about the um, scandal and then put it behind them and, for you know, in perpetuity have said after that when asked about it, they're like, look, we dealt with that. We put it behind us. We're moving on. Um, and I thought that was kind of from a point of someone who watches politics and how people handle these scandals, that was, to me, a real break with how uh, other couples were were doing it. So I thought they were fascinating. Now, wasn't there another couple that sort of modeled themselves after the Vitters in not going so public on it? Or was it just I would say I would say the Trumps have, have sort of taken that path as well. Yeah, Melania is great at that. I know she is good. I, I I came out of here with just I got to tell you of, of all the of, of all the women you know are my favorite women. I mean you know how do you how do you not have how do you not have Eleanor Roosevelt as a favorite woman? And no matter what your political affiliation is, you you know your respect for Hillary Clinton is just you know off the chart. But yeah. I was so impressed with Melania, and it may just be me. You know I I don't know if you <laughs> intended that in the book, but I walked out and I said. I like this woman. This um, woman has guts, you know. Smart and, yeah, true. My, I ended up uh, having admiration for all of the women that I, and and, and more of a feeling of um, compassion, too. I want to get into that because I I walked away with with the same conclusion, that these women are not wallflowers, Far from it when you read their histories, that they are not wallflowers, they're not pushovers, that there was a strategic intention behind all of it. And there was a sense, we'll talk much more about this, but a sense of resolve and resiliency in them that is uncommon in human character. I Mm -hmm. that they're they're so impressive. But let's go on to my I hate to admit it, but my favorite story. Of of Huma Abedin and Anthony Weiner, and the poor guy. How did he get that last name? It's almost like a comic book. Yeah, yeah. So um, tell the story yeah, of them. We, sure, but uh, not to skip over the scriptures. We'll come back to them. Oh, did I skip um, over this? I did skip over the scriptures. Yeah, no, let's yeah. go back. Let's go back to them. All that's right. that's important. Zelda right. and Elliot. He was a real hard-charging, quote-unquote, sheriff of Wall Street. I mean, he had been attorney general in New York and and was really um, crusading, righteous guy, and then became um, discovered that as governor, he was having uh, sex workers come to his apartment or hotel when he was staying out of town. And um, he decided to resign. He and his wife said she urged him not to. She she urged him to to try to ride it out. And um, this is the couple on which the uh, the Good Wife television show is based. Oh, that's right. That's right. I recall that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then your favorite. Early. Well, I you know my favorite is just it's just <laughs> too funny to be true. I mean, you know, there's a yeah. there's a there's a, there's a joke in there that's just 
I enjoy Anthony Weiner. He is a combative person, but he's super smart. His heart is in the right place. And, you know, I always enjoyed him as a politician on the New York scene. He was a congressman when I met him. Um, he ended up tweeting a photo of himself in his underwear to a woman that he was sexting with. And um, rather than send it, you know, a DM, <laughs> direct message, he sent it to all of his Twitter followers. 48,000 people you you wrote in there. Uh, that, then he sent uh, it to 48, sent his junk to 48,000 people. Oh, my. Exactly. That's, exactly. Uh, and so then he subsequently, um, the, uh, the president, Barack Obama, said, if I were Anthony, I would resign, which I think in um, political speak is pretty much, <laughs> you know, you ought to do this, Anthony. And so he did resign. The couple had a baby. They regrouped. And he said that he wanted to run for mayor of New York City. But there's some evidence that they knew that there was more sexting out there, uh, more women that would come forward. I think it was really sort of um, reckless of them to, to step into the campaign again, uh, knowing that might happen. And then, of course, he was ended up exchanging messages with an underage Yes, Girl, right, with the 15, 15 year years old. old. Yeah. Right. And um, which invited the FBI to do an investigation. They wanted to look at his laptop and his wife's laptop. And then all of a sudden, the um, FBI was right before the election, 2016 election, um, because Huma was working for Hillary. The, the um, investigation of Anthony Weiner's sexting ended up reopening the investigation of Hillary Clinton's email right. before the election, and um, which, you know, some people say cost her the election. I don't know, but just a real... Um, yeah, there was a big thing. brouhaha about her, mm -hmm. about her emails that were... You know, any little thing. I don't know if she is today, but she was at least one of, if not the chief advisor to Hillary. I, I listened to a few newscasts on her, and she's she is an extraordinarily intelligent, articulate woman. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure what she saw in Anthony, but like I said, he's, he's quite a um, a sharp guy. And I'm sure he can be quite charming. You know, I get into that in a bit, but, you know, maybe we'll, we'll talk about it now. But isn't that true of all the men that, I mean, they're, they're pretty much Ivy League or equivalent educated, extremely mm -hmm. influential in university. They held campus offices. They were leaders of different movements. Mm -hmm. um, very influential people. These are These are not just your everyday... You know, B average student. This is the top of the game. These are every one of these people are extraordinarily influential, intelligent, and as a result, powerful. Are they not? Absolutely, and I think that plays into what kind of marriage that they um, they entered into, and and the expectations that both people in the couple had for how their life was going to play out. And I think that that plays into their decision to stay in the marriage. I think there's a lot of feeling that our kind doesn't get divorced. And, and also an idea that if you follow certain rules, you can, you can stay in, Stay powerful. What sorts of, do you have any idea what sorts of rules those are? Well, I um, put them under a patriarchal rule saying okay. um, right. you kind of have to, uh, you have to do what is expected of you. And I think, um, 
I think the bitters are a very good example of that. They, you know, they shut down the conversation about the scandal. David was reelected to the Senate. Now he's out of public life. He's a lobbyist. But um, years later, Wendy was named by Donald Trump to the federal bench. Right. She right. has a lifetime appointment. Right. And I think it's a way that the Republican Party says, thank you. Thanks for playing by the rules. Oh, interesting. I'm already just loaded with questions, but um, I want to get into our our final and, you know, I can't say most interesting, but it's our, our most recent couple of Melania and Donald Trump. And I, I have blank notes underneath them because I have so many notes. I decided not to fill up my page with all these notes. But, mm-hmm. but tell me about Melania and Donald. I mean, it's you, you know, Melania, not not all of them, like Eleanor, you know, not not all of them came from rich families. And actually, Jackie Jackie Kennedy did not come. She came from a once rich family, but not so much right. a rich family. Mm-hmm. But Melania was different. Melania was raised in communist Yugoslavia and and where patriarchy was the rule where whatever the whatever the man did was was gospel and if he had affairs, he had affairs. He just went along with it. She was raised with that mentality, and yet she was able to conquer that mentality where she lived by that mentality, but she's an extraordinarily strong woman. Um, at least that's what I read. That's what I got out of it. I, mm-hmm, was, mm-hmm. I was very impressed with her with her um, convictions. Tell me about Melania and Donald. Well, I was fascinated by these two because it, Donald had so many rumors and, and accusations flying around him, and it didn't seem to me that the voters cared very much about it. And this is unusual. You think about how tortured the Clintons were by the accusations about Bill how they had to go in 60 minutes and talk about it and, and try to appeal to voters and especially women voters. With Donald Trump, there was, you know, they just did not go that route. And so I thought, wow, this is really different in American politics to see this. So I definitely have to include this this couple. I agree with you that I was really surprised by Melania's upbringing in Yugoslavia and found that he had a lot in common with Donald's first wife, Ivana, Right. also raised in an Eastern Bloc country. And I do think that that made them comfortable with an authoritarian man. And I think that that's, you can see that in their marriage. But, you know, um, but but the comfort was not with Melania. It was not a um, subservient sort of comfort where she just mm. lived whatever he wanted to say. She's got her own rules, and she plays by her, she plays by Donald's rules, and so she's very close to Donald. So she's not against Donald. She's Donald's, according to w- what I read. You know, she's one of his keyest, most key advisors. Because she's not only tells him the truth, but she's extremely invested in his success, and he trusts mm-hmm. that. But at the same time, she will not compromise her values. I think that that's right on. I I do think that she's. Um, I mean, I, one of the stories I loved best about her was when she came to New York. She left college in Slovenia and went with her sister to Milan and tried to become a, and had success as, as a model, right. then came to New York. Again, this is, you know, another step up apparently in the modeling world. And she was very serious about it. She didn't go out on the party circuit like a lot of right. um, beautiful young women. And I think that that really impressed me. I mean, in your 20s, you're in a great city and uh, surrounded by um, beautiful people, I would think that that would be really tempting. And I think she was instead 
very serious about her career. Do you think that had to do with coming from poverty? This is something I can't compromise. I'm not going to go back to that. I'm not going to challenge. I'm not going to. I'm not going to threaten that. Maybe, and I think also both of her parents were within the confines of being in a, in a communist country. Were very successful. Her mother was a, an executive or manager at a, at a clothing factory. Right. Her dad apparently was real fancy dresser and dealt in um, high-end cars. So, you know, I, I think that they always had ideas about making more of themselves. Maybe that's what inspired her. You know what I want to do is now now, now we've given an overview and given everybody a, a, a bit of a taste now I want to get into the drivers and into, to you know, the strategies and tactics and talk about, I, th- I think the familial backgrounds, you know, the parentage had so much to do with both the male and female characters, how they came together and they were sort of, they were, they were sort of a perfect storm of this, each one needed the other in in whatever way and i i I want to get into that but before we do it we need to take a quick break and then we will be right back and get right into some meat okay Hi there, this is Charlie Hedges, and you're listening to the next chapter. And my very special guest is Anne Michaud, writing the uh, interesting, controversial, insightful book, Why They Stay, Sex Scandals, Hidden Agendas, and Deals of Eight Political Wives. And we've just been through the the characters and what, what they've been about. So you had, you had an idea of... You got an idea of, of what's going on in mostly the United States, but international politics. And now I want to get into what are the drivers of the women and the men? What gets them to 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 behave this, this way? Now, I think it's important to describe just, and I already did this, how unique these couples are. Um, many of the men, all of the men, and I didn't, take tabs, but I think probably half the women attended Ivy League educated, or at least three of the women were Ivy League educated, extremely popular in school, off the chart influential, inordinately driven, and Mm -hmm. um, in several, this is true in several cases, but it's especially true with Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton and Bill were like a team, were they not? They, They didn't they viewed that they were going to change the world together, did they not? Yeah, I think they talked about their courtship and ideas for their future as the journey. That was the phrase they used. So what was it? You know, I, I, I'm always wondering, you know, there, there comes a, a time where these cases become public but the spouse has to have some indication that something's going on. This is not new news to the spouse. Do you think it is? No, not at all. When I first started looking at these cases, I thought, oh, well, maybe they Hillary just didn't know. And then I thought, after reading as much as I did about the history and, and all the books that have, you know, been written by people who know them and... and it just was pretty clear that she knew that he was the kind of guy who was a little, was compulsive about women. I think same with Melania Trump. And um, they made some deal with themselves that this was not the most important thing, the fidelity, but perhaps, and I think in both cases, you know, they, they hoped that it wouldn't be, so public, so much in their face, so humiliating. So, 
Now, wasn't there another couple besides the Vitters that decided to kind of go on the low, you know, keep it low, down low, rather than rather than going extremely public? I mean, the Trumps for sure. But mm-hmm. was there another couple that did that, or was it just the Vitters and the Trumps? Um, pretty much those two. I mean, I there's this sort of fairly well-known story now about the time right before the 2016 election when that Access Hollywood tape came out where Donald said, you know, he was recorded saying, I can grab women right. by their private parts and right. nobody, you know, and, and I'm a star and they let you do When it. you're popular, they and let it, you do anything. <laughs> right after that, there was a series of women coming out and saying he harassed me, he he assaulted me. And so to come back at that in the hopes of, you know, keeping their candidacy alive, the political consultants, I think it was Kellyanne Conway, Mm -hmm. who said, you know, I think what you ought to do, Donald, is go on TV and talk about what's happened, say that you regret it, you know, just own up and 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 let the American public know that this is not something, you know, that you're okay with right now. Sort of the Bill that. Clinton mea culpa. Exactly. That's the playbook. And um, on one side of him would be Melania, his wife, and on the other side, Ivanka, his daughter, who were both very popular with women voters at the time. And um, that was the idea, but Melania said, no way, not doing that, and she shut it down right away. Yeah, I I like the way you put it in the... I inserted my own phrases of what she told them, and it included the F-bomb. You know, just say, <laughs> just say, are you kidding me? This, I am not doing this. Don't think about this. It is over, so... Told mm-hmm. Kellyanne Conway, you know, think of another strategy because we're not going to do it. And it and it worked. You know, had had they gone another track, who knows who knows if it would have worked or not. But this this worked for them. That that mm-hmm. it was it was just it was it was a it was a great power play on her part. And it really was. And she That's saved she of- saved him. She saved his rear end. That sort of imperious, you know, we're we're not going to stoop to that level. I, I think that worked for the for that couple. Yeah, it certainly worked for the Vitters. That was now, you know, their marriage didn't turn out. I mean, they they didn't stay married, right? Aren't they one of the ones that divorced? You know, they're together. Are together, and she's the long-standing lifetime appointment judge. Yeah. 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 But that silence was the key. You really don't have time to get into your five criteria that you you have five excellent criteria. Mm-hmm, I, would, mm-hmm. I would encourage the readers of the book to go by the five, but we just don't have time to do that. But what I would like to do, I have this feeling that although we have different situations, the men come from very similar situations. It seemed to me that you know they they came from affluence. And, and, you know, Bill didn't come from affluence, but he rose to it very quickly. He was a personality in and of himself. There was not a lot of people like Bill Clinton. They had theirs, but the women, some of the women came from like like Jackie Kennedy. You know, affairs and adulterous affairs were just part of their lifestyle. That was, mm-hmm. you know, you just you just learned to live with that. And there were, so there was a handful of the women that had been through that. They had seen that movie and so knew how to deal with it. It wasn't a big shock. And then there's a handful of, you know, the Eleanor Roosevelt's and, and you know, even Melania, you know, who was raised very differently. Who They all seem to me to have a common characteristic. I know what mine was. I'm curious yours. Do you find a common characteristic among these women that kept them involved in these marriages? Well, I'm going to say I think they were extremely 
stubborn. I think that they wanted to decide for themselves what their future was going to be, and they weren't going to let some political consultant or some, you know, opinion writer for, for some newspaper insult them, decide what they should do. I think they chose their direction, and maybe stubborn isn't the word, but um, steadfast. Yeah, I you, you know a word I used and and and, it, and it's like steadfast. It's it's resolved. They had a certain resolve in themselves of mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. of personal pride and certain expectations that they wanted to live up to that they weren't going to let their mm-hmm. husband screw that up. But then also also I mean with you know especially Hillary and and Eleanor. Now, one side, let me say this, one side that you make very clear throughout the book that that the majority of them were very interested in maintaining their husband's success, that they, you know, and that's that's why Bill is so attracted to Melania is because she cares about one thing, and that's his success, and he believes that. Mm -hmm. So he trusts Mm -hmm. her. He trusts, he knows that she is, she's not going to go against him on anything. There is something almost unusual these are these are very specially psychologically equipped women that they have mm-hmm. they have they have a depth of self understanding a depth of goals uh objectives ideas of who they want to be who they want their family to be and they are just going to make that happen no matter what. So you have that side. And then you have the Eleanor and Hillary's that, you know, now Hillary was all for Bill's success because that was their, you know, co-presidency decided success that they wanted to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Hillary also used that platform. Hillary could have been, you know, a lifetime judge, could have, who knows, she could have been extraordinarily successful. But I doubt she would have run for president was she not the wife of Bill Clinton. Here's the way I'm putting it, that this is this is evidence of extreme patriarchy in the United States. And these women didn't kowtow to patriarchy, but they used it to their advantage. Instead of instead of instead of rebelling against patriarchy, you can't do this, I'm gonna divorce you, I'll show you, you son of a gun. They said, okay, you want to play this game? I can play this game. And I can play okay. this game to my success. And and Hillary and Eleanor certainly did that. Mm-hmm. Would, would you agree, or is that just Charlie's crazy thoughts? Well, I love that you say this is evidence of extreme patriarchy, because I do think that's true, and I think that these couples are are very much bought into that way of of living your life and that in terms of whether they used it to their advantage sure but i think that they it wasn't their personal individual advantage necessarily no i think that they you know that 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 they thought of the family you know in the larger sense themselves their their spouse, their kids. I mean, I think that... And their country. And their country. Look at what Eleanor and and Hillary did for the country. True, true. I mean, Eleanor, who had more of an impact than Eleanor? She probably had as big an impact as FDR. I know. I know. Really. It's it's amazing, her um, strength. Yeah, she's an amazing woman. What was an amazing woman? Let's talk about patriarchy and let's go. This is kind of off topic, but it was there were a couple of interesting quotes that you that that and and I'll only use one. And I, I think this quote that you used from Marielle Trump. Now, Marielle Trump is she a stepsister of Donald or? That's his niece. 
That's his niece. Okay, mm-hmm. his niece, and she wrote a, a a brilliant piece that speaks so much of Donald. But I think I think it it speaks of a lot of politicians and a lot of people who are privileged and have earned or wormed their way into power some way. But Mary Trump, a clinical psychologist, wrote of the Trump family. And she wrote, Donald needed to prove to his father that he's the tough guy, the killer, the Mm. best. And above all, that he is not weak. And this is the line that got me. And the ways to be weak in the Trump family were to be kind, to admit mistakes, and to apologize. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's i had i was i was showing a guy at the club that i was working with and he says that's pathological i mean that not pathological that's a sociopath that is that is the hallmarks of a sociopath mm. but you know i don't want to go that far necessarily although i did say it publicly those are the issues that our women are dealing with mm. they're they're dealing with that kind of Because I don't think Donald is all that unique. I think a lot of fathers, I think Joe Kennedy was that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I think think there's a lot of these very famous, powerful fathers that had almost nothing to do with their children or very little to do with their children until they they came of age that they could get in business. And so, so they have these deep psychological issues that seem to help them succeed, and also, as we see with Donald, that can be his downfall. But these, but but the women that you've chosen to write about have elected to deal with that and have created strategies around dealing with that, and I'm not so sure these men would have been successful without these women. Yeah, I think um, when you read that quote um Mary Trump, I think. Didn't you feel as though that was reflected a um, man that we saw as president as well? He didn't want to be seen as weak. Oh, yes, absolutely. That was him. That was Donald. That was what Donald learned. The way not to be weak in the Trump family was, or the way to be weak in the Trump family was to be kind, to admit mistakes, and to apologize. You know, you you just you just never didn't do that. Doing it. I know. Not who that man was. Yeah. Well, Anne Michaud, I got to tell you, um, it was so much fun reading your book. Um, It is filled with yellow highlights. Um, I was at, did I already say I was at a women's gathering today? I did, didn't I? And, you know, everybody wants to read the book. They all came up to me. They saw it on on my table as I was writing. What is this book? And and I told them, so they're all anxious of reading it and can't wait to hear the podcast next week. And so, um, and, and Michelle, wow, you, this has truly been one of my, um, one of my most interesting shows. And, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your precious time with us. Well, Charlie, uh, this has been such a pleasure and to have someone really engage with um, the work that I did is such a delight and I appreciate your questions and your observations. Thank you. Thank you. Now, how how would you like people to get in touch with you? I'm going to put it I'm going to put the in the show notes, I'm going to put a link to your book. Mhm. They can reach me through my website which is um annemichaud.com so it's a n n e m i c h a u d Okay, I will put that in the show notes as well, uh, and and we look forward to hearing more. You've got you've got an ebook out now, as right as well too, don't you? Yes, it's um, an ebook and paperback. And I was told yesterday that I need to get on the um, audio book, so <laughs> I'll try that soon. Okay, so I, I'll get that in the show notes as well. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It was. It was a true pleasure. I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in to the next chapter with Charlie. And until next, this is Charlie Hedges signing off. Bye for now.